We're five. Are we in chapter five? Okay. Let me go back. May I study for the wrong chapter? No, it's just kidding. <laughs> anyway, we've been talking about the healing of the layman at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, Jesus did that. You remember all eyes of those, the multitude of lame and blind and deaf that were there at the pool were waiting for the waters to be stirred, and hence in jumping in, uh, they would be healed. And there was a lame man there uh, in the midst of this multitude of uh, people who were infirmed, and they were waiting for the waters to be stirred up. But this lame man, who was probably on the outside of the multitude of people, uh, had fixed his eyes on Jesus. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? And of course, uh, he said, I don't have anyone to throw me into the pool so that I can be healed. And so Jesus tells him what? To, uh, to get up, uh, take up your bed with you, and commence to walking, right? And so he does it. But there was only one problem. What day did this fall on? It fell on the Sabbath, and so on the Sabbath day, you weren't supposed to do any work. And so a little bit later, as the lame man was walking with his bed, there were some Jewish leaders that came up to him and said, hey, who told you to carry your bed? This is the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be doing any work on the Sabbath. And instead of celebrating with the man that he was healed, they were criticizing him because he was carrying up his bed uh, during uh, the Sabbath. And so he said, I have no idea who it was. All I did was when I was healed, I did what he said, and here I am. So they wanted to know who this man was who healed him. He didn't know at, the point, at that time. And so a little bit later, he is in the temple probably to receive cleanness, a, cleanse, a cleansing so that he could be made clean. And uh, Jesus is there and, and tells him to, uh, to don't fall back into that same sin that got you there. And so he begins, then Jesus begins this discourse with the Jewish. Now, we don't know whether they were religious leaders or they were just the common people who were there because it was during the Jewish feast. And so Jesus was having a conversation uh, with these Jewish leaders. We'll call them leaders at this point. Uh, and they were questioning him about the Sabbath. And Jesus tells them, hey, listen, I'm just continuing the work that my father has already been doing. And so they were accusing Jesus of, number one, a healing on the Sabbath, and number two, of equating himself with God himself, which was punishable by death. And so Jesus now has this discourse with them, uh, and in verse 18 uh, in the same chapter, this was why the Jews were seeking to kill him, because he was breaking the Sabbath not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own Father, thus making himself equal with God. And so the Jews were incensed, and as Jesus now makes conversation with them, I can imagine that their anger began to boil over as he continued now with his discourse. Look at verse 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, some of your versions, I think the King James Version says, verily, verily, I say unto you. Interesting that Jesus uses that phrase uh, because what that phrase truly, truly means that what I'm about to say is true, but also it means uh, that the person making that statement has firsthand knowledge of what he is saying. And so Jesus would have that, right? He, I mean, he came from the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his sin, his only son. And so Jesus now has firsthand knowledge of the truth now that he is going to give these religious leaders as he speaks to them. Verse 19, and so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son, speaking of himself, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father do doing. Interesting. Now, we learn something about Jesus here now in his earthly ministry, that what Jesus did, he did not do on his own, but he only did what the Father showed him that he was to be doing. There is no separation there with Jesus and his Father. There is no separate existence. Uh, they are alike in their being. They are alike in their action. They are alike in their nature. And so Jesus is just, even on the Sabbath, continuing the work that his Father has already been doing. And what he sees the Father do 
Jesus now continues to do. Uh, it's interesting that Barnes says this in his commentary, if one does all that another does or can do, then there must be equality. If the Son does all that the Father does, then like Him, He must be almighty, He must be omniscient, all-knowing, He must be omnipresent everywhere at once, and infinite in every perfection. That was Jesus in relation to His Father, the Son and the Father. And so here we are, the Jews are accusing Him of blasphemy, and blasphemy implies opposition to the very God that they serve. And they were saying this to the Son of God who is equal with God. Now, of course, they don't know the truth, right? Jesus was speaking the truth, and He was speaking it boldly. I mean, it was just a matter of fact for the Son, capital S, but to them, this was foreign. And so, verse 20 says, and, and Jesus continues here. He says, for the Father loves the Son, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, He loves the Son, that, um, and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. Interesting. And again, Jesus does nothing of Himself, but only what God, His Father, tells Him to do, and so, which was the continuation of God's work. It's interesting, throughout the Gospels, we see that there are periods of time when Jesus separates Himself from uh, the people, separates Himself from the disciples, and will go off by Himself to pray. And I thought to myself, why would the Son of God need to pray? To God the Father. Well, we just read it right here, right, Gary? Because the Father was teaching him and telling him and showing him what he needed to do. On well, one incident in, in uh, Luke chapter 6, uh, Jesus, after performing miracles and healing the sick, uh, uh, he goes up into a mountainside and he will spend the night praying. He will spend the whole night praying, and after that night, he comes down, and in the midst of all of his disciples, he picks out 12 chosen. Now, why did he do that? Well, he was all night spending that time with his father. Father, what should I do? What do you want me to do? Uh, lead me, guide me, show me. And so he was able to receive that information from his father. He comes down and chooses out the 12. Among them is... Judas Iscariot, the one who will. I find it interesting that Judas will spend three years with the Savior and hear all of his teaching and experience all that miracles, and still at the end, he still betrays the Son of God. And so this is what Jesus does. He does not do it on himself, in himself, but he does what the Father shows him. And then he says in this verse, and greater works than these will the Father show the Son so that you may marvel. I can just see him just him pointing to the religious leaders so that you can marvel. Now, what is he uh, talking about here? What is he talking about these greater works? Well, immediately, you remember, this is at the beginning of Christ's ministry. And so there will be healings. The sight will receive. Uh, the blind will receive their sight. The deaf will receive their hearing. Uh, on two incidences, Jesus would raise the dead uh, the widow at the, in the town of Nain, and, and afterwards, right before his triumphal entry, he would raise Lazarus from the dead, and he tells them, you will marvel at these things. In a few short years, Jesus would be crucified on the cross, he would be buried in the tomb, and then on the third day, he would what? He would rise from the dead, greater things that you will see. Fifty days later, Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit comes down, the church is born, and there have been miracles after miracles after miracles ever since. The fact that you're here this morning and that Christ has changed your life. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature is a miracle in itself, right? Think about where you were and when you met Jesus Christ and where you are now. Don't you thank God for that? That he has changed your life. And so Jesus said, and you will marvel. And looking way into the future, hey, I'm coming back. And I'm going to bring my church with me. And then I'm going to set, I mean, these are things that we haven't even marveled at yet. And so Jesus said, you will marvel at these things. And then in verse 21, he begins to show them now and in the near future what some of those greater things are. Number one, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, 
so also the Son gives life to whom He will. And so the Jews were familiar with God raising the dead. I mean, the song of Moses back in the book of Exodus, see now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. They recognized that God could raise the dead. Solomon proclaimed this. He said, He has the power of life and death. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, Elijah prays and the widow's son is raised. In 2 Kings, chapter 4, Elisha prayed to God uh, that God would raise uh, the Shunammite, Shunammite's woman's son, and he did. And so the, familiar, the, God, the Jews were familiar with the God of the Old Testament raising the dead. But Jesus says here, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. Now, what do you think these religious leaders are thinking? Don't you know that their head is getting, they're getting mad, the steam is beginning to come out of their ears because Jesus is equating Himself now with God. Now, what does Jesus mean here when He says, uh, I will give life, the Son gives life to whom He will? Now, is He talking about spiritual life? Well, I think that's obvious. You remember the Samaritan woman, he said, I will give you what? Living water. And so Jesus is talking about spiritual life. And later on, we're going to see in Christ's ministry that he will raise the son in the town of Nain. And he then will call uh, Lazarus then from the dead. So he was talking physically as well. And so Jesus says, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life spiritually and physically, physically to whom he will. Now, they didn't know that yet, but they will. And he says, here's another Not only will the Son give life, but verse 22, for the the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Circle that word judgment, because that's the exact opposite to gives life. Not only is the Son willing and able to give life, but the Son also has been given the responsibility to judge mankind. That judicial function has been given to Jesus Christ Himself. All of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of what? Of Jesus Christ. That responsibility has been given to Jesus. And so what Jesus is saying, not only has the Son the ability to give life, But he also has the ability to pronounce judgment on those who refuse his call. You see, everyone is given a choice. Everyone is given a choice to either choose life, Jesus offers that, or to choose judgment. How? By by refusing life. And so Jesus has both of those powers here, and this is what he is saying. For what purpose? That all may honor the Son. Listen just as they honor the Father. Now, what do you think they're thinking now? Oh, man, they're getting ready to pick up some stones because what Jesus is saying right here now is blasphemous and deserves to be, they deserve to be stoned according to the book of Deuteronomy, according to their law. What Jesus is saying right here, to honor means to esteem or to revere or to give praise or to give homage to We honor one when we ascribe to him in our hearts and in our words and in our actions the praise and obedience which are due him. That's what Jesus is saying here. All judgment has also been given to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. What Jesus is saying here is unbelievably radical to how the Jews believe right here. And then look at what he says here. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Do you think there's a finger of indictment right here? Now, is Jesus, is Jesus pointing this out to them, or is he just giving them a truthful statement right here? Listen, you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. You say you honor the Father, then you will also honor the Son as well. I mean, again, this statement is directed to those who professed to know God, but yet they determined to kill the Son. (laughs) You see see the difference right there? And Jesus is pointing this out to them right here. uh, But you know, in the end, 
at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Truly, truly, number two, look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Lee. Truly, truly, I say to you, Lee. No. Uh, whoever hears, listen, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now, we brought this up in our Sunday school class at 930. Just because a person believes God doesn't mean they're believers, right? It doesn't mean they're children of God. Just be, I mean, I meet people, you meet people every day who say, I, I believe God. And so what Jesus is saying here, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him, God, who sent me. You see, that's the difference between just saying God and God, the God who sent me. The Father who loves me, for God so loved the world. What did he do? That he gave his only begotten son. That's what set capital G-O-D apart. Our God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And so that distinguishes our capital G, God, from a little G-O-D, which could mean anything. The God who sent his son, Jesus this is what Jesus is telling him. I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Who believes not only that he is my father, but that he sent me as his son, his only beloved son, to give his life for you. That's in essence what he's saying right here. Interesting, that's how salvation happens, isn't it? We hear the word of God first. Uh, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Uh, how many of you remember when you heard the gospel for the first time? And then it says, and then believes on Him who sent me. You see, it begins with hearing, I hear the Word of God, and then I believe what I hear. That's what salvation. What is it that I believe? I believe the fact that Jesus came, that He loved me, that He willingly gave Himself for me, and His blood was spilled on that cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And when I place my faith and trust in the empty cross, in the empty tomb, that's my salvation. That is counted to be as righteousness. And so when God sees my heart, he no longer sees me. He no longer sees me in my sinfulness, but he sees the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And when Satan accuses me before God and says, you don't know what Buzz did this week. You don't know what Lincoln did this week. But Jesus looks over and God he says, yeah, he's human. But guess what? The blood of my self covers his sins. And so Satan then has to run, the accuser of the brethren. Why? Because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And so Jesus says here, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Listen, if you've accepted Christ into your heart, you have eternal life right now. You don't have to wait. You already have eternal life. We talked about that in our class today. What is the hope that I have? The hope that I have is that I have a home in heaven, that I'll be with Jesus forever and ever. But I also have hope right now. I have hope in the fact that he speaks to me, that he wants to hear from me. I have hope right now that he is in control of everything that is around me, even when it looks like it's spinning out of control. So he has given me hope now, and he has given me hope in the future. Amen? What a hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But he says here, and that person who hears and believes does not come into judgment because of my sin debt, but has passed from death unto life. You see, it's my faith and trust in, in Jesus Christ and the grace that is offered to me that allows me to pass from death, which is judgment, right? Right? This is where I belong because of sin, but because I believe in Jesus Christ, I have passed from death unto life. Now, again, this is all foreign to them, but Jesus continues. Look at verse next, 25. Truly, truly, again, Jesus, yeah, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming. In other words, he's kind of giving them warning. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. 
I believe he's talking about the, the present and the immediate present right here. That there will be those who are, uh, who are destined for a judgment will hear the voice of God. The hour is here right now is what Jesus is saying. Uh, Jesus will uh, be buried and he will rise again. The church age will be born. That's what I believe Jesus is talking about. There will be those who are dead in their sins who will hear the voice of God. He calls us the dead. Because, because before you met Jesus Christ, you were dead in your sins. But then when we met Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us that we have been made alive or our spirits have been quickened so that what we once were, we no longer are. When I was dead in my sins, now I am alive in Jesus Christ. Why? Because I heard the voice of God, the Word of God, and I placed my faith and trust in him. That's what Jesus, Jesus is telling him what's going to be happening, but it hasn't happened yet. Right now, they're just hearing the voice of physical Jesus, right? Place your faith and trust in me now. But those who hear will live. This is an interesting paragraph, and I want you to listen. I, I took this out of Ellicott's commentary, but he depicts uh, this, uh, this scenario so beautifully. Listen to what it says. The world is as a vast moral graveyard where men lie dead in their sin. Sense-bound, hand and foot, with spirits buried in bodies which should be holy temples, but have become as unclean tombs. But, but the voice of the Son of God speaks, and spirit, love, life passes through those chambers of death, quickening souls whose death is as yet but a sleep. And those who hear and obey come forth into new life. Isn't that an awesome statement? I was dead in my sins. Jesus called, I heard and I believed, and now I am alive in him. That's what Jesus is saying right here. And many would respond to that call in the three short years that Jesus was alive. Um, many have responded since that time, since Pentecost. Uh, how many of you can remember the time when you accepted Christ in your heart? I mean, I do. I was eight years old. I was at a camp meeting way back in 19... <laughs> way back then. <laughs> I can remember. It's like it was yesterday. I, I remember running up the steps. To, to, I couldn't wait to tell my mom that I had accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. Why? I heard the voice of God. I heard the word of God. And I placed my, even at eight years old, I understood it. And I placed my faith and trust in him. And guess what? I had eternal life then. I have eternal life right now. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever in, in, in my heart. Look at what he says in verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Listen, God is the source of life. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have anything. But we just looked at this morning, when God created the heavens and the earth, that word created means that he made out of nothing. He made visible what was invisible. He didn't make visible out of visible. He just spoke it into existence out of nothing. The God that we serve, God is the author of life. He is the living God. And so Father has granted that same life to His Son. He always was, He always will, and He always will be. Remember our study in the book of Revelation? He always was, is, and will be. The prophets and the apostles are never represented as having such power in themselves. They never. They were dependent. They performed miracles in the name of God and of Jesus. But Jesus did it by his own name, his own authority, his own power. He had but to speak, and it was done. He is the author of life. Verse 28, and this is where we'll close uh, here. Do not marvel at this. Now he takes it a step further, a giant step. Remember that step on the moon? This is one giant step. He takes a giant step here as he's talking to these religious leaders. Do not marvel at this religious leaders, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. We're talking about the future now, the distant future. And come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, 
and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Everyone's going to die, right? And we've talked about this in the book of Revelation. There'll be two resurrections. There'll be a resurrection of life. There'll be the rapture that will happen when the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the air, and so we shall meet with the Lord. But the dead will come first. Why? Because they have six feet farther to come, right, than us. We're all going to be caught up together with the Lord to meet Him in the air. That's the resurrection of those who are alive in Jesus Christ. And Jesus will be there. We'll all stand before the Bema seat, uh, the judgment seat, not to be judged for our sins, uh, the sins that were already judged where? On the cross. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. We'll stand before that Bema seat to receive the rewards or don't receive our rewards. Uh, that's the judgment uh, seat for those who are alive in Jesus Christ. But there's also the judgment seat for the unsaved, for the dead that Jesus talks about. Right, He's talking about this way before the fact. Just as there is a, is a resurrection of the, the, the life in Jesus that we have, so there will be the, as a resurrection of those who never found Jesus Christ. And that's found in the book of Revelation. If you would just turn to there, and I think we'll kind of close with this. Revelation chapter 20, last book in the Bible. You should be familiar with this. We took a year and a half to go through this. Verse 11, chapter 20, verse 11. Those who, of us who are alive in Jesus Christ, we've already been raptured. We're already in the presence of Jesus Christ to be with him forever and ever and ever. But what about the unsaved dead? Look at verse 11, chapter 20. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Who do you think that is? That's Jesus, right? The judge. He's been given that responsibility. And from his presence, from the Son's presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, those without Christ, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up to the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were cast or thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The words that Jesus speaks here to these uh, re religious leaders really gives them a choice. In essence, what he's saying, you can either believe or not believe. Not just in God, because belief in God does not save me, but it's in what God did, the fact that He sent His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. That's what saves us. And so the choice is there. The Jewish leaders don't know it at this point because it's early on in Christ's ministry. Jesus is asking them simply to just believe in Him as He is right now. And so that same choice has been given to mankind ever since and will continue until the rapture happens when the trumpet call of God, the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ will rise first in Christ, then we who are believers and alive will be caught up together with them in the air and so we shall ever be with the Lord. The unsaved will continue to live, right? We talked about the seven-year tribulation. We talked about the thousand-year reign. But at the end of that thousand years, there will be another call. And the dead without Christ will hear that call, that voice. And they will be raised from the dead. And then they will stand before that great white throne judgment. Uh, not to have a choice at that point to choose heaven or hell. Their fate has already been sealed at that point. Very sobering, is it not? Uh, but now we have a choice. 
We have a choice of either death or life. Life in experiencing and believing in Jesus Christ and death by refusing that call. I know most of you in here, and I believe most of you know Jesus Christ. I can tell by the smile on your face, but maybe some of you don't. Maybe some of you listening in, I don't know who is or who isn't. Maybe many of you have experienced that faith in Jesus, but maybe you have not. I'm giving you this opportunity right now. We are giving you this opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus and experience life that can only be found in Him. In fact, the word life is the Greek word zoe, which means life as God intended life to be lived. You see, when we cross that line of faith and accept Jesus Christ into our heart and we become a child of God, we then begin to experience life as God intended life to be lived. He didn't want people to live separated from God, but that's what sin did. It separated us from God. That's why Jesus came, because the cross is the bridge between mankind and the very presence of God, the cross of Jesus Christ. And we just accept it, believe it. He who hears the Word of God, you're hearing it right now, not because it's me, but because it's truth from the very words of Christ Himself. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can and will be saved. Believe on all that He did for you. Believe in the fact that He loves you. And that He willingly shed His blood so that we could have life and hope. Not only in eternity, but now. I'm not alone. Hey, there'll be times where I'm, I'm by myself, but I'm not alone. Why? The Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and He speaks and, and talks, and we have fellowship together. I'm driving the car, and I'm talking to Him. People are looking over, and I'm saying, I'm just praying, you know. <laughs> the guy's a little wacky, you know. <laughs> Do you know Jesus Christ? That's the question this morning. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in the quietness of this moment before we end off in a prayer song. And those of you who are listening in, the question is, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you were to die and pass from this life this day, do you know where you go? John tells us, these things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. You can know it right now. Well, how can I know that? Just placing your faith and trust in Him. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we use that term saved so much, it kind of has lost its meaning. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall become a child of God, shall become a true believer. If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God loves you and that He raised Jesus from the dead, you can become a child of God right where you are. You can choose life. We have license plates that say choose life. I'm talking about eternal life. I'm talking about life as God intended life to be lived. You can have that right now, either here in this auditorium or if you're listening in. Just call out to Him, well, what do I say? What do I pray? Pray something like this, but please pray it from the heart. You don't have to use these exact words. Pray, dear Lord. Hey, I know I'm lost. I know I'm a sinner. You don't have to tell me that. I know. But I believe that you love me. I believe you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me, for my sins. He paid the debt that I owe. Forgive me of my sins, Father. I deserve death in my sins, but I believe in you. Father, now help me to know that I belong to you this day or this hour, this very minute, Lord. Thank you for loving me, Father. With every head bowed and eye closed. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to ask you to do one thing, and one thing only just so that I can pray with you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just raise your hand real high and just put it back down again? 
And by raising your hands, see you're saying, yes, I prayed that prayer this morning. I asked Jesus into my heart. What about you at home? Did you pray that prayer this morning? I won't see your hand, but God sees your heart. This world has a lot to offer us. Satan has a lot of distractions there. But as this last song that we're going to sing as a prayer this morning, and you, you can pray it sitting down. We'll put the words up on the screen. It's a song entitled, Give Me Jesus. The Bible says only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only he can change your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace you'll never knew, sweet love and joy, and uh, heaven too. Only Jesus. So let's just sing this together. If you need the words, the words are on the screen. But let's close our service with this song as a prayer this morning. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, so give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Oh, when I last verse says, Oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, so give me Jesus, give me Let's go in that peace this morning.